Welcome to this special edition of Success Life Radio. It's a special edition because it's the replay of our Fun Friend Friday episode with Kevin McNeil. Who's Kevin McNeil? Well, Kevin McNeil is an author, a motivational speaker, an empowerment coach. He owns a motivational speaking company called Believe. This company specializes in empowering abuse victims to recover their true authentic selves and live out their life purposes. With over 10 years of experience in public speaking, training and facilitating across the United States, there is nobody better equipped to help us understand the impact of abuse and trauma, not only from the victim perspective, but on the larger family and community perspective. So I hope you'll take a moment, settle in, get out your pens and papers, and enjoy this special edition of Fun Friend Friday, Success Life Radio. If you're listening to this show, it probably means you're hungry for change and hungry for growth and ready to start building your life of success. Living your life of success is possible, and this show can guide you to the mindset, habits, and routines that will let you build your life of success starting now. With your host, Eric G. Reed. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's Success Life Live. My name is Eric Reed. I am so glad you are here and tuned in and watching us. Um, it's Fun Friend Friday, my favorite day of the week. Good morning, Kevin. I'll be bringing you into the room in just a minute. So go ahead and you know finish the hair and the makeup and all the other things that we do before we jump on to an event like this. Everybody, I want to welcome you into today's Fun Friend Friday. Good morning, David Peterson. Good to have you in the house. Yes, I know. I owe you a replay or a uh, tag and a coffee. Good morning, Craig. Good to have you again. Congratulations on making top 10 on the John Maxwell stage um, last week. I know that was a big accomplishment. And a, 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 it was a stepping stone, a big stepping stone. Yeah, I'm finishing my hair. You go with that, Greg. So a couple things coming up as we log in and sign in. Um, remember that next week on Wednesday evening, we're having an author talk. Um, this is the author edition or the final proof edition of Wendy Burns' book, um, Remarkable You. And it's been a lot of fun reading it and getting ready for it. So you, um, it's a journey of, as she puts, uh, hope to discover unshackling, revealing, and enabling you to become the remarkable you. Fabulous book. Fabulous book. Go over, check out her uh, pre-order site. Again, Remarkable You, Wendy Burns. Um, and then about mid-September, we will be having... Oh, well, that's not very useful to you guys, is it? Um, Liz Akar back on with her second book. Still working out the title details. But So those two author talks will be coming up. Um, in the month, and then um, next week's Fun Friend Friday, if you've been struggling with how to make social media happen for you, like you know you're supposed to be on social media, but it seems like this big mall of America, too many things, too many options, too much stuff to venture through, then you're going to want to be here for Fun Friend Friday with my friend Phil, an expert. Good morning, Miss M or good afternoon, Renee. Um, good morning, Sylvia. Uh, man, everybody just piling in. Take a minute, hit the share, hit the like, hit the community button. Make sure all your friends, family, neighbors, countrymen, and those people you have influence tune in because I promise you, I promise you, this is going to be big. Kevin is going to be big. Um, as you can tell from the description above, Kevin has quite a history, quite a bio. Um, there's a lot going on in Kevin's world, and I really appreciate him being here as our Fun Friend Friday guest. So often in this dialogue of abuse and trauma um, and sexual abuse, a male voice is missing. And that's both culturally um, as well as genderly. That it's, it's a voice that needs to be heard. It's a voice that's been silenced too long by cultural um, norms. And so I'm so 
grateful that Kevin chose to break his silence and not in just breaking his silence, but he has gone like big time sharing his message, getting it out there, exposing the truth, and so that kids can begin to recover and adult kids in recovery. So I'm gonna pop Kevin into the room. So Kevin, if your hair and makeup isn't finished, you're just in trouble. So aside from all those, Kevin is big. There he is. Good morning. (laughs) Yes, sir. You are good morning. How you? Yes, sir. How you doing? I'm excited about this conversation. Yes, sir. I am. I gotta tell you, this week digging in and finding all the little bits and watching your videos. Thank Uh you, sir. Oh, appreciate that. That's, that's that means a lot to me. I'm so grateful to have a platform to share my story and to share what's so important to me and the rest of the world uh, as it relates to trauma and abuse and how it's affecting our future. And so, you know, my whole goal is to make tomorrow better for today's children. So to, to give them a world, have them incorporate uh, their passions and not just accept the world that we've created for them, but them to get involved in creating the world that they want. And you're, and you know, I love people of action, but you are bold exactly. action. You've written yeah. Understanding Child Abuse Investigations for Mommy and Daddy. So if your child mm-hmm. is in the middle of an investigative period, nobody ever tells yeah. the parents, this is what's going to go on. This is normal. Nope. Yes, you, the husband, will be investigated. You, the mom, <laughs> yeah. will be investigated. Yeah. Don't take it personally. And yeah. so I love that idea that it's, and it's done in the dummies for you format. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because often in the middle of that trauma, the parents are trying to not only manage it emotionally as parents yeah. and then as individuals, but also logistically and legally. Mm-hmm. They have to be oh, in yeah. so many roles. Yeah, and a lot of times what happens as law enforcement officer, I was a law enforcement officer for 20 years and an investigator for 12 years. What was happening was most investigators were finding that parents were getting frustrated with the process. Well, the reason they were getting frustrated is because we never took the time to explain to them the process. Oftentimes, we would take their child, take them to a back room, interview them, and then bring them back out and say, okay, we'll call you in a couple of weeks to let you know next steps. Well, that's kind of frustrating for a parent who feel like they don't have the power to help their child in this most devastating time. And so a lot of times what happens is this, this, this disconnect between law enforcement and families happens because law enforcement uh, doesn't understand that when a, when a child is abused, it's not just the child, it's the whole family is disrupted. And so if we don't educate the parents, because a lot of times what happens is we, we would arrest the, sub, the suspect, remove the suspect out of the home. But then we'll take the child and put them right back in the same environment which the abuse occurred. Not understanding that the brain actually associates the environment as well as the act together. So we re-traumatize the child even by putting them back in the same environment. So we don't educate the parents on how to change the environment to be conducive to healing. Then what happens is the child has a less likely chance of being healed fully from the trauma that was enacted by the abuse. Yeah, um, an example I offer, and I've worked with foster families, foster parents. Mm-hmm. If it had an F in front of it in Gwinnett County, I've been yeah. dealing with it forever. And I would uh-huh. say to you, glass ice hitting a glass is a cool mm-hmm. drink. To a child yeah. that's survived trauma, that's the first step in mommy or daddy yeah. having drink, and then mommy and yeah. daddy having two, and then three, and then me getting beaten, mm-hmm. and then nobody there yeah. in the morning to take me to school. And they can mm-hmm. see the pattern that is triggered by just that sound of the ice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because the brain never was meant to forget. The brain was brain remembers based on survival. So the brain remembers triggers, whereas something may look you know, ordinary to us, to a child or a person who's been traumatized, it could trigger an event and cause them to actually uh, feel something that is, is no longer present in their lives. That's why we get post-traumatic stress disorder, right? The brain associates a trigger with the event, even if the threat is no longer there. And as a result of that, the person is, the person is not even conscious of why they're reacting the way they act reacting they just react and so we judge the behavior why not without without understanding the person and the trauma associated with the behavior so we end up judging people rather than listening to them and this is one message that i heard over and over again as i've listened to other tv interviews that you've been on and podcasts and Mm -hmm. your Mm -hmm. your your speech is we judge the behavior Mm -hmm. 
and we address the behavior modification, behavior correction, we institutionalize yeah. based on the behavior and yeah. never ask what was the origin or what is the echo that yeah. is creating this behavior. Yeah, yeah, and I often tell people that I is a, is a great judge, but it's a horrible listener. Right, Ooh, you have to listen with you. Yeah. That's horrible. Yeah, yeah. Somebody today, yeah. the yeah. I is a great is a is a great judge, but it's a horrible listener. You cannot listen with your eyes. You need your heart to do that. And so, oftentimes, what I teach detectives and people who deal with you, become curious because becoming curious allows you to have compassion. And once you get compassion, it allows you to connect with the individual and it's through connection that you're able to communicate. So it all starts with a curiosity as to why is this person responding to this the way they're responding to it? You know, and a lot of times we judge people. And right now, currently what I tell people, we have a system right now that only responds to abuse. The system that we have right now in place responds to abuse it doesn't seek out to prevent or to uh, uh, deal with abuse victims so we 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 incarcerate but we put the victim in a situation where they have to deal with the trauma I often tell people but Okay, here's the thing. You can't arrest trauma. You have to deal with it. You have to confront it. And you have to educate people about it. And so a lot of times we have a system. If you think about it, if you really think about it, we hold victims accountable and responsible to stop their own abuse because until they say something, the abuse continues, particularly when it comes to children. And so we have a system. We hold yeah. the victim responsible. We hold the mm -hmm. victim responsible for preventing their, their abuse. own abuse. Yeah, yeah. Because if you think about it, you know, we have, <laughs> I mean, yeah, we get, we yeah. have to laugh. That's a bit ridiculous, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, like, yeah. Because sure we question, and then and then goes yeah. back to that old saying of, "Well, she asked for it. Did you see what she was wearing?" Yeah. So we question the victim, but we give the suspect the benefit of the doubt, right? So the victim has to be the 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 abuse victim is the only victim that has to prove that they're a victim, right? The assault victim, the gunshot victim, doesn't have to prove that they're. Uh, a victim of assault, the gunshot wound enough is, 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 a, is proof enough, right? The burglary victim doesn't have to prove that their house was broken into, the alarm, the missing merchandise, the kicked in door is the proof. Uh, a car theft victim doesn't have to prove that they're a victim of auto theft because the missing vehicle is the proof enough. But when it comes to abuse victims, when they make the allegation, we say, can you prove it? And then we question them repeatedly. And if there's any inconsistencies in what they tell us, we automatically assume that they're lying, but we don't understand how trauma fragments the brain and causes the memory process to be interrupted because the certain uh, neurotransmitters and uh, the chemicals like cortisol disrupts the hippocampus, the part of the brain that helps us remember, right? And so this whole idea about fight, flight, freeze, we actually had it backwards, right? So, because most people say, why did they fight them off? Why didn't they run? Well, the natural inclination is when you traumatize is to freeze. It's a survival response. If I walk up behind you and start you, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to take a deep breath. You're going to freeze without you even being, you know, knowledgeable that you froze. And another thing that you got to remember is that part of the brain uh, that, that deals with freezing is the Broca's area where you speak. So people ask, why don't you scream? So I had cases where children were molested in the rooms where there were, there were, there were parents and there were uh, siblings in the other room. And one of the things people used to ask, you know, the jurors used to be, why didn't they scream? Well, the first thing that is taken away during trauma, during a traumatic experience, is the person's ability to talk, to speak. And so what happens is we live in a culture that we keep re-traumatizing victims so they remain silent because the moment they say something, they get questioned, they get challenged, they, they're not believed. So, so let me rewind. Lord, I'm mm -hmm. going to be studying you even further. <laughs> so... So often we approach, we, when I say we, the general population, the, un, mm -hmm. the uneducated, and I put myself right dead center at the top of the curve yeah. for that, okay? Got you. Is, is, is we forget that there is a biochemical process that's happening mm -hmm. during that trauma. We just assume yeah. it's a physical, he touched me, she oh, yeah. touched me, they grabbed me. Yeah. And we're like, well, why didn't you respond with equal physical force? Force. Yeah, because cause what happens is in a traumatized state, we freeze. And we flee if we can, and we fight if we must. Right? That's the, that's the so real order. So we freeze, we flee, we fight. 
yeah, we don't fight, flee, freeze. We freeze automatically, which is instinctually, which is impulsive, which is a survival uh, uh, response. And then if we can find a way out, we'll run. And then if we can find ourselves not able to run, we're trapped, then we fight our way out of it. Well, think about so, it when it comes to child so, abuse. So as, so, so I'm sort of like sitting in the room as mm -hmm. the victim or mm -hmm. um, the person who had just experienced trauma. In mm -hmm. that moment when it occurred, my brain, my body, my survival mechanism, the, the biochemical wiring said, shut down everything except vital organs. Curl yep. up and evolve, guard yourself, because Play dead. It, we need to maintain the heartbeat, like all things yeah. breathe and heartbeat. So screaming would be a waste of that vital organs. Like, you, like there is like what? an actual, like, if you scream, it will put us in further danger. Shut up. Exactly. And uh, in, in addition to that, the part of the brain that your voice comes from is shut down. The left hemisphere, the broken Because areas. the brain is it's, saying preserve energy, preserve yeah. fuel, preserve because the, blood. Yeah. Get the limbic system, the most basic human yeah. function zones only. Yeah, and actually, what happens is your brain is hijacked by the survival system, the limbic system, the amygdala, that your alarm system is hijacked. So that part of the brain takes over, like you said, it controls your breathing, it prepares your muscles, right? And so it it, tell, it directs blood in areas that are vital to survival. So what happens is it takes away from those areas the social brain because you, now you're dealing with the social brain. When I'm trying to survive, I don't have time to be sociable. So the parts of the brain that is used for social interaction is taken away from me because it's needed for the survival so, part of me. So is that, I'm just going to be like banging you with questions. <laughs> no, so is okay. that why often when abuse victims try and recant the situation, height, color, gender, oh, clothing, man, that's the all wrong of those questions. elements are missing because yeah. those are social, yeah. we learn those through social interaction. And yeah. so the brain isn't registering that as vital information in the moment. It's not. Because now what you're asking me, you ask me who, what, when, where, why questions, which is the cognitive part of the brain, which is part of the social brain. And that's part of the brain is not readily available to me because I'm still in a traumatized state. In fact, most law enforcement officers recreate the traumatized situation. So that, for was, instance. that was going to be my yeah. question next is, yeah. so in the event, so I'm trying mm -hmm. to dig this out. So stick gotcha. with me because I said I'm at the top of the pyramid of the dumb <laughs> gotcha. man. Uh, so in the event, my brain uh -huh. says no cognitive function is necessary. Do not even think about it. Like, mm -hmm. we've got to do what we got to do to stay alive. Um, yes. And then when I come into the police station, so to speak, and mm -hmm. I realize the situations are all different, just as, and I come mm -hmm. in and you say, tell me what happened. I'm like, I don't know. Immediately, yeah. I'm assumed as not legitimate, like the crime didn't yeah. occur. Like I'm just calling, like all of the, the doubt yeah. of my story rises to the top. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then as you begin to pressure me, my brain yeah. says, uh-oh, here we go again. We're about to get yeah. attacked. Shut everything down. Shut everything down. And not only that, as police officers and law enforcement, we're trained to arrest suspects, not to cater to victims. So what happens is we use victims to get to our suspect. And victims, because of the state of mind that they're in, because they're already sensitive to, to their environment because they have been assaulted and they've been traumatized, they pick up on everything. So victims are more intuitive to know when, when a person really doesn't care about what happened to them. I'm more concerned about you giving me information than I am about how you were affected by what happened to you. So, for instance, if I go to the hospital and a victim, I get called out to the hospital as a detective. And a victim is laying in the bed, right? She's laying in the hospital bed. As a detective, I come in, I got a gun on my side. I got a badge around my neck. In my mind, the victim should see that I'm a detective. I'm a safe person to talk to. However, in her brain, it, the, the traumatic situation just been recreated because most of the time when victims are assaulted, they're laying down, right? And then most of the times, the assailant is standing over them. So I just recreated that traumatizing situation to the brain. So the brain is shutting down the social part and the trying to remember part because now I just put that victim in the same situation that they were in when they were attacked. Because you got to remember the brain not only remembers the act, it remembers the situation around the act. And so here I am with this gun that I have every day as a police officer that I'm accustomed to, but it may be the victim's first time ever seeing a gun, or it may be the same weapon that was used upon them during the assault. So the part I'm asking them to remember, because you got to remember trust and memory go hand in hand. If I can't trust that I'm safe, 
then me remembering is going to be more difficult. And most police departments think just because victims walk in front of, walk into a police station or the police is present, they feel safe. In fact, in some instances, the victim may not feel, may feel even more, even less safe because now, again, like you said, they got to remember the information or that, that happened to them. And if I don't remember correctly, could it be possible that this person won't believe me? And here's and then, another thing I tell you. And then we layer on the idea that many victims are victims by proximity. Yeah. Uncles, aunts, cousins, brothers, yeah. dads, school teachers, mm-hmm. football coaches. And so yeah. if I step out of my community and yeah. declare this event occurred and I can't be convincing enough, not only do yeah. I have to go back into that community, but now I go back into that community somewhat unprotected you, with yeah. a police you're officer judged. following me in and pointing a yeah. figure at the people. Yeah, and judge. And, and not only that, this is what I tell people. Healing is a disruptive act. It's a revolutionary act. So when, it, when the victims come forward, they're not just asking for justice. They're asking for restorative justice. Help me not only to stop the abuse, but help me heal from it. So most of the time, the police departments just go in to stop the abuse, but we don't set up a restorative practice where we can help the victims heal from abuse. Now, there are other agencies that can come in and do that, but most police departments do not set the victim up for success. They're just more concerned about the prosecution of the case. So, so Kev, I, dude, you are brilliant. You are brilliant. <laughs> but that's probably why you have over five books on Amazon on this subject. Yes, sir. So, and on my side of the page, everybody is just like, it's a, a nausea expression, gobsmack. They're just like, this is too mm-hmm. much information. So I love that. Mm-hmm. By the way, I've got to drop the plugs. Well, the 12 Project, if you want to know, book, get involved with Kevin on this level, go to the 12 Project. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about that. You can find mm-hmm. it everywhere on social media. But here's what I think is interesting. When you said the word, it's not just justice, because we think that victims come forward because they want that punishment. Like, I yeah. want yeah. you oh, to yeah. punish him. Oh, yeah. In fact, what you're saying is it's really about restorative Don't justice. Worry. Like, I need yeah. to get back to a place that it, before oh, yeah. it happens. Like, oh, yeah. if somebody breaks into my house and my TV is missing, justice is served by the police department and restorative yeah. justice is somewhat served by the insurance, insurance company. company. Yeah. Whereas yeah. So, if I come yeah. into a police station and I admit mm-hmm. being um, traumatized or being in the middle of trauma or abuse, you can't always follow through on the, on the justice justice because mm-hmm. of the, the nature of the crime and all of the little details, or you have mm-hmm. to spend so much time focusing on it.